Tell me what you remember about the keeper. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat. Pain shot through my broken arm. I only recalled bits and pieces of my encounter. The ungodly strength of the keeper's hands. The smoky, tic-tac smell of his breath. The faraway look in his eyes. As though he lived in another plane of existence. Do you have any questions specifically? The detective's name was Miller. Her male colleagues took a wide berth around her. She was hardened. The last person in the whole station you'd want to meet in a dark alley. My style is a bit unorthodox, Miller said. I like to listen, to let you tell it, and not get in the way. Will that work for you? The events of the past week were blurry. I recall little gray vignettes, slivers of memory, pinned throughout a full-scale blackout. After I escaped, the doctor who examined me said the muddiness of things had to do with the belladonna, which we were force-fed in our captivity. But I had to remember as much as I could. I owed it to the girls I'd left behind. If reliving the story stopped even one more girl from dying, it was worth it. We're trying to create a physical profile, Miller said. Why don't you start by telling me what the keeper looked like? I took a deep breath and let myself go back to the first thing I remembered seeing a huge man standing behind me in the reflection of my bedroom mirror. It had been a Wednesday night, a few hours before he abducted me and took me to the butterfly house. I'd come home from the late shift at the restaurant, wanting nothing more than to take a shower and rinse off the day. But once I walked into my bedroom, I noticed that things looked touched. For one, there was a small duffel bag sitting by the door, then I saw that the drawers and closet door were open, with various clothes strewn about the room. The keeper packed a bag for all the girls, one of his signatures, enough clothes to make us comfortable during our week-long metamorphosis, before we were reborn. When I saw him in the mirror, standing behind me, the first thing I noticed was how big he was. He was built like a gorilla, six and a half feet tall, close to 300 pounds, he had a massive, distended gut, swollen from what I guessed was years of too much drinking. But he moved fast. As soon as I saw the mask he wore, vintage black aviation goggles and a plain black face covering, he pounced. He covered my mouth with a chloroform-soaked rag, and I slipped into a dreamless state. I woke up in a small, concrete-floored room with the worst headache I'd ever had. There were two other girls in the room. I noticed how much we looked alike. Dark brown hair, fair skin, below average height, all of us around five foot three. We were the keeper's preferred type. All the girls he kept in the butterfly house looked similar. The other girls were awake, their eyes full of terror. Who are you? I asked. My, I, my, my name is Claire, said one. Then the other. I'm Jessa. The room was windowless. Its walls were painted bright, robin's egg blue. Each of us had a metal cot in a plastic bin for our clothes, which had been neatly folded inside. The duffels that the keeper had used to pack for us were gone. The room was otherwise free from furniture except for a large metal chair. A moment later, the door opened. The keeper walked in, pushing a cart of food. He left it, then went outside and grabbed a sledgehammer which he wielded with one arm, given his size. In his other hand, he carried a whiteboard with an Expo pen magnetically attached to it. I looked at the food cart. My stomach growled. I was starving, and the food looked delicious. Three glasses of juice and three pieces of pie. The keeper's mask was gone. He had a medium complexion. His face was pockmarked with acne scars. His nose was reddish covered in a tangled circuitry of veins and exploded blood vessels. His eyes were bright, neon pink, thanks to the contacts he wore. He always wore different colors, depending on his mood. I also noticed his hair, bleached so blonde that it was almost white. It had been twisted into tight French braids, which clung to his massive skull like albino centipedes. The pigtails hung loosely over his shoulders. Hello? He said, his voice an artificial, sing-song falsetto. 
You must be hungry. He gave us each a plate. I thought about not eating the food. Every fiber of my instinct told me not to. But seeing that the other girls had already started eating, I did as well. Where, where are we? Asked Jessa, washing down the pie with a swig of juice. The butterfly house, said the keeper. A sanctuary where insects are reborn. Insects? He motioned to us with his massive hand, his bratwurst-sized fingers outstretched. Then he sat down in the metal chair and began drawing on the whiteboard. The drawings were childlike, arranged in a circle with arrows pointing clockwise. He motioned to the top drawing, a misshapen circle labeled egg. I'd like to explain your metamorphosis, he said. You're the egg room, which will be your home for the next few days. He smiled. Three insects contained in prisons from which you must be liberated. The keeper's teeth were stained yellow, some of them rotten. His gums were so receded that I could see the exposed roots. After 72 hours of fertilization, he continued, You'll progress to the larva room. Therein you'll experience a metamorphic stage involving ample nourishment and physical transformation. I pushed away the slice of pie and the juice, noticing that Claire and Jessa had done the same, but my equilibrium was already starting to dissolve. I felt woozy. My head spun. After larva, continued the keeper, delighting in his opportunity to enlighten us. You'll progress to pupa. Pupa. I remember the word from somewhere. High school biology, maybe? Pupa was the cocoon. The chrysalis caterpillars entered before they became butterflies. And after pupa, said the keeper, imago. He pointed to the final drawing. It looked like a butterfly a little girl might draw its wings crooked and outstretched at comical angles. But the butterfly drawing looked alive, vibrating with a strange energy. Amidst dizziness and hallucinations, I could see that it was morphing, coming to life. You are to be reborn, said the keeper. A new species, the nightshade butterfly. I'll keep you here, a sanctuary for insects awaiting the realization of a much greater purpose. The room was beginning to spin. Jessa had started vomiting. Claire was pale, her head lolling around loosely on the pivot of her neck as she fought for consciousness. You're to eat a steady diet of nightshade, said the keeper. If you're wondering about the physical effects you're experiencing, it's due to the toxins in the berries. Pie. Juice. I'd eaten almost all of it, overcome by hunger. Atropa belladona, said the keeper. A proper diet for butterflies in the making. Then I passed out for the second time. I woke up when a drop of liquid splashed into my open eyeball. I tried to blink, but my lids were being forced open by the keeper's strong, calloused fingers. I tried to shift away but I realized that my arms, legs, and head were strapped down to the cot. Did you know, said the keeper, that women in Renaissance Italy took belladonna because of the way it made their eyes look? That's where it gets its name, from the belladonnas. Optometrists use a belladonna for dilation as well, but in much smaller doses. He smiled. The stale, Baroom's stench of cigarettes and booze rolled out of his mouth, though he tried to mask it with spearmint tic tacs. He also wore the pungent, cloying perfume an old woman might wear. I do love the way it makes my butterfly's eyes look, he said, like a doll's. Please, I said. My parents have lots of money. My dad's a. Money? interrupted the keeper. What makes you think this is about money? He pried open my other eye, though I fought as hard as I could to keep it closed. Plunking in another eye drop, he told me about his motive. Insects have always disgusted me, he said. 
But once I realized I could help them transform into butterflies, my life became meaningful again. Jessa, Claire, and I discussed trying to escape a dozen times or more, but it was just a pipe dream. Our diet consisted of things infused with belladonna. Its side effects included dilated pupils, blurred vision, loss of balance, hallucinations, and with enough, delirium and paralysis. I experienced all of it. But eating what the keeper brought us, I had no other choice. Me and the other girls, the eggs, also talked through the walls to the girls in the second stage, larva. They sounded weary. They told us that once you graduated to the second stage, you were fed only berries, which the keeper scattered across the floor like dog food. One day, Jessica, Claire, and I awoke to the sound of blood-curdling screams coming from the larva room. The girls were pleading for their lives. We heard a massive thumping sound until eventually, the screaming stopped. When we whispered through the wall that night, we were met with haunting silence. I didn't ever find out why woman earned the keeper's hatred. He said he did it out of love, that he wanted to liberate us from our six-legged existence. But given that we all looked the same, I guess that something had happened in the keeper's disturbed life that gave a genesis to his cruelty. We reminded him of his mom, or his sister, or some other woman who had slighted him along the crooked path of his life. After three days, the keeper dragged us to the second room. Larva. I wanted to fight back but didn't have the strength. The room looked almost identical to the first. Three metal cots, no windows, a plastic bin for our clothes. The keeper had already moved them while we'd been sleeping, folding them neatly inside. As opposed to Robin's egg blue, this room was painted a pastel shade of pink. At first I thought the room's color made the concrete floor look rosy, but after my eyes adjusted, I realized that there were blood stains in the concrete, and I screamed. That evening, I asked the keeper if he could hand us the nightshade berries, instead of scattering them on the floor. But he giggled with sadistic delight, then politely declined my request. Later that night, Jessa, Claire, and I heard the sound of crying from the egg room. More girls. The keeper had brought in his next group of victims. The three of us listened as he explained the metamorphic process as he had to us. The girls were crying, complaining about feeling woozy. I wanted to scream through the wall to tell them not to eat what the keeper was giving them, but I couldn't find the physical strength. Eating the berries directly, which I had no choice but to do, amplified the nightshade's toxic effect. Before I had been dizzy, discombobulated, now vomiting was a regular occurrence dehydration and hunger so severe that we had no choice but to scrounge for berries like starving mutts. A night later, Jessa, Claire, and I decided to whisper through the wall, just like the girls who'd been in the larva room before us had done. What the hell is he doing to us? asked one of the girls. How can we escape? We need to get out of here. We have to find a way. But there was no way out that I could see, and I'd almost given up hope. The most terrifying part was that I didn't hear anything in the next room over. What I assumed was the pupa room. No screams, no whispers, no last futile attempt at brokering human connection through the basement walls before the keeper's plan came to fruition. The one thing I did hear was the occasional muttering of the keeper as he went about his work. But the girls were silent. Late one night, I woke up to the sound of whimpering and another sound, kathunk, kathunk. Through bleary, belladonna dilated eyes, I saw the source of the noise. The keeper was standing in the middle of the room, his shirt off, his distended, swollen gut spilling over a tool belt. He was sweating, his face screwed up in determination, but his centipede, French braid pigtails hung over his shoulders, undisturbed and neatly tied. Jessa was lying on a thick wooden rack, Naked, her arms, legs, and head, bound down with leather straps. Stop. Make it stop. The keeper was using his sledgehammer to pulverize her legs. She was too weak to resist. 
Even if she had her strength, she wouldn't have been able to resist on account of being bound down. From next door, one of the girls whispered through the walls. What's happening? She sounded terrified. Ease, I managed. She's... But I couldn't find the words. I was too shocked, too stunned to do anything but watch in horror as the keeper continued maiming Jessa. I looked over to see that Claire was slumped against the wall. Her eyelids were barely open, but I saw that her eyes were crossed, lazily. Very colored vomit spilled down her chest, which was rising and falling in slow rhythm. She was alive, biologically, but mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, I knew that she was dead. I tried to get her attention anyway. Claire, I said. Kathunk, kathunk. Claire, we have to do something. She was gone. Gone to a place I hoped was less cruel. The steady diet of Belladonna had poisoned her. It had ruined her brain. She'd become nothing more than a pitiable larva awaiting the next stage of metamorphosis. After a final, well-aimed swing of his sledge, the keeper nodded to himself. Then he undid the straps, binding Jessa's broken legs to the rack. He pulled the staple gun from his belt. He moved Jessa's legs together and began suturing one to the other. Horror welled inside of me as I realized he was creating a caterpillar's tail. Mercifully, Jessa didn't scream. She only continued whimpering. Whatever feeling had once existed in her lower limbs was gone. After a few more minutes, the keeper left the room. His work done for the moment, but he left the door open, thinking that both Claire and I were drugged to the point of no return. I found a sudden measure of strength, courage, something I didn't know existed inside of me, an unquenchable burning desire to survive. My legs still wobbly, my senses still blurred, I stumbled over to the rack Jessa was bound to. I crashed into its wooden edge, sending a shock wave of pain through my hip. Please, Jessa sobbed. Please. My drunken fingers fumbled with the straps binding her arms, weakened from days of malnourishment. The belt clasps were heavy, the leather thick and unbending. I dug deep, clenching my fists, returning sensation to my hands. Then I pulled as hard as I could. All the while, I kept one eye on the door. I looked for the keeper, but I also looked at the open portal to freedom. I wanted more than anything to just run, but I couldn't leave Jessa behind. My eyes kept drifting to Jessa's mutilated legs, to her tail. New atrocities distracted me with every passing second. I heard a door close down the hallway. The girls in the egg room began screaming through the wall, asking what was happening, drawing attention. I thought I heard the keeper's heavy, thunderous steps plodding outside, but shook away the thought and returned to helping Jessa. With the straps finally removed, after what seemed like an hour, I fell to the berry and blood-slicked ground, exhausted. Jessa slipped off the rack and hit the ground with a wet smack. Immediately, without hesitation, she began crawling toward the open doorway, her tail making a slithering pattern in her wake. Help, she sobbed. Help me. I'll come back for you, I said, stepping past her. The other girls, I have to save them before he comes back. I stumbled out into the hallway, which I'd never seen until then. We were deep in the bowels of a house, a basement or a bunker, something underground and hidden from the world. To my left, the hallway led to a staircase. To my right was what appeared to be a dead end. I couldn't tell, it was too dark. All I could see was a light revealing a sign over the room next to ours. A hand-painted sign written in the keeper's childlike scrawl read, Egg Room. I stumbled to the metal door and checked the knob. Of course it was locked. The girls on the other side approached the door and began yelling at me. Let us the hell out! It's... It's locked. Find a key. You have to find a key. They began screaming louder, drawing more attention. I sobbed, fumbling futilely with the doorknob. I felt a sudden presence behind me, and instinctually I ducked. The keeper had come back, 
swinging his sledgehammer at the back of my head. It whistled over the top of my skull, so close that my hair floated after the disturbance it had made in the air. It had been swung so forcefully that it tore through the steel door of the egg room like a soda can. With the sledgehammer lodged in the door, afforded precious seconds. I crawled between the keeper's legs, got to my feet, and began running down the hall toward the stairs. When I passed by the larva room, I tripped. Jessa, still slithering across the floor, grabbed at my feet, tripping me. Please, she moaned. Please. The keeper had begun plodding down the hallway toward us. He dislodged his sledge. His heavy footfall seemed to shake the foundation of the concrete basement. Behind him, reaching through the hole his sledgehammer had torn into the door of the egg room, I saw the girl's bloody hands. They writhed against each other, clogging the hole in the process, grating themselves on the slivers of torn steel. I struggled out of Jess's grip, crawling on all fours toward the staircase and the light of the first floor. But the keeper was right behind me. I ducked into a dim room on my left. I looked overhead as I went in to see another hand-painted sign, Pupa Room. Outside, I heard Jessa pleading with the keeper. He yelled at her, kicking her away, but the distraction bought me precious seconds. I stood up, pushing past what felt like heavy bags you'd find in a boxing gym. They were hanging from the ceiling, made of thick black leather with bulging shapes inside. Reaching the back of the room, I looked behind me to see that the keeper had walked through the door. You are treading on very thin ice, he said. The sing-song falsetto had been replaced with authentic, booming wrath. Do not disturb the cocoons, or you'll experience a fate much worse than death. Cocoons. I studied the one in front of me and I realized they were body bags suspended from the ceiling with chains. The one I was looking at, its bottom chest level, began writhing. A thick liquid, like the gelatinous drop that collects on the tip of a soap dispenser in a public restroom, was seeping from its base. The liquid was dripping from all of them. It coated the floor in a sheen of clear jelly. The keeper made his way past the cocoons carefully. This was my opportunity. Disturb the pupa. I was terrified by what I'd find inside, but without stopping to think, I unzipped the body bag in front of me. A vaguely human shape slipped from the cocoon and onto the floor, resting in a flood of clear jelly. The body belonged, I guessed, to one of the girls I'd whispered to from the other side of the wall when I was still in the egg room. She looked like me, like all of the Keeper's victims. Dark brown hair, fair skin, below average height. She was still breathing ever so slightly. You bitch. The Keeper was staring at me from the other side of the half dozen hanging body bags in the room. Other girls he'd abducted and forced into his horrific metamorphic cycle. His bleach blonde pigtails were sussed, beginning to fray. His eyes glowed, a blinding, furious orange thanks to the contacts he'd chosen that day. You're disturbing them, you insufferable damn bitch. The majority of the body bags remained motionless, but a few others had begun to writhe, the girls inside of them still clinging to life. I looked down. The girl who had fallen from the body bag I unzipped was blind, her eyes dilated and milky. Her legs were broken, stapled together like Jess's. This was the second to last stage, the stage where he killed us. He zipped us into body bags filled with some sort of preservative jelly and left us to die. Disturbing the cocoons would be a mercy. If I'd been on the other side, I would have wanted someone to come along and end the suffering. Knowing I had no other option, knowing that my window for survival was rapidly closing, I went to another body bag. This one was motionless. Almost too weak to stand, I clung to it. Then I grabbed the zipper and stared the keeper directly in the eyes. I'll unzip more of them, I said. Unless you let me and the other girls. With one inhumanely strong arm, the keeper planted his feet and swung the sledgehammer, it tore through the body bag I'd been clinging to, sending the dead girl inside spilling to the floor 
and a spray of preservative into the air. The sledge also connected with my right arm, shattering it on impact. I fell to the ground, screaming in pain, lying alongside the two girls, one dying, the other already dead. The keeper looked stunned. He was staring at my shattered arm. Your wing, he choked, beginning to sob. Your beautiful wing. Finding a final sliver of strength, fighting past the pain, I pushed myself to my knees with my good arm. I began crawling toward the door. The keeper turned his attention to the moving body bags, shushing them, stroking his black leather, whimpering to himself and muttering unintelligibly. Stroking the black leather, whimpering to himself and muttering unintelligibly. I reached the door. Looking to my left, I saw the stairs leading to freedom. But on my right, I heard sobbing. It was Jessa. She was lying on the ground looking up at me. Her stapled legs sprawled uselessly behind her. Come on, I said, reaching to her with my one good arm, tears flowing down my face. Grab my hand, Jessa. Come on. Go. There was a terrible recognition in her eyes. Go. Save yourself. But this is all for nothing if you die too, Jessa said. Find help. You can still help the others. Jessa, go. Now. She was pointing into the room behind me, the one filled with body bag cocoons. The keeper had begun making his way toward me, past the writhing masses. He was unhinged with rage. I turned from Jessa and ran left toward the stairs. When I looked over my shoulder, I saw that she'd grabbed the keeper's leg, slowing him. You sick bastard, she said. You're not going to hurt anymore. The keeper stomped on her head, cutting her words short. But her distraction bought me time. The keeper began sobbing at what he'd done, cursing and slapping himself in the face. I ran up the stairs and pushed past the basement door. I reached the first floor. It was a house, a normal house. It could have belonged to anyone, any regular law-abiding citizen. It was immaculately kept, unlike the slaughterhouse basement. But there was something strange about the art on the walls. They were adorned with massive shadow boxes. Inside each box was a dead girl. Their arms were crucified, their flayed skin stretched away, pinned down, painted with elaborate butterfly patterns. Their blind, forever dilated eyes stared out blankly, their mouths agape. All of them were painted a deep violet color, accented with bright pink and white paint. The keeper's new species, nightshade butterflies. Behind me, I heard the floorboards creak. The keeper had reached the first floor. He was staring at me, his eyes orange and ablaze. Two violent embers shining in the dim light of the house. Your wing, he said, looking at my mangled arm. Let me help you, please. I turned and ran. I reached the front door to find that it was unlocked. I pushed past, running out onto the porch, tripping down the front stairs. We were deep in a forest. The stars twinkled overhead. The bright moon illuminated a path forward through the woods. I ran as fast as I could manage. All I heard behind me was the keeper's sing-song words floating gently through the silence of the night. Your wing! Your beautiful wing! My attention returned to the interrogation room. Miller, the detective assigned to my case, was staring at me with a mix of sympathy and terror. Her legal notepad had about a dozen flipped pages, each filled with notes about my story. She reached across the table and held my left hand the one that wasn't contained in a cast and a sling. I'm so sorry for everything you've been through, she said. You're brave, braver than I could ever be. I nodded to myself. It was beginning to dawn on me that people saying I was brave. It was the truth, despite the self-hatred I felt for leaving the other girls behind. Do you have any leads? I asked. The detective drew a breath. We're gathering more information, she said. The trucker who picked you up gave us the mile marker, but as you said earlier, you ran for the whole night. That swath of wilderness is uncharted. 
but were looking. I hate myself for leaving the other girls, I said. What other choice did you have? I lowered my head and began to cry. Miller let me. After a minute or so, I looked up. Is it true? I asked. Is what true? That the keeper, that he leaves a shadow box with a butterfly in the abducted girls' rooms. Miller nodded. Yes. She stood up, walked around the table, pulled up a chair and held me in her arms. You're safe now, she said. We're putting you into witness protection for as long as it takes to find him. He can't hurt you any longer. Miller and a large, friendly, well-armed police officer drove me across town to my house to pick up some things. When we got there, I noticed that two other cop cars were parked outside. Three policemen were standing on the front porch waiting for us. One of the officers helped me out of the car and walked me up to the front door. We'll let you get your stuff, he said. A few changes of clothes and whatever else you need, but you can send any of us back here, anytime. I nodded and smiled. Thanks. Do you want me to come inside with you? Asked Miller, opening the front door for me. No, I said. I can manage. I'd like to spend a few minutes alone. You let me know if you change your mind, she replied. I'm right here. I walked inside, remembering the feeling of walking inside on the night I'd been abducted. Everything was untouched, just as I'd left it. I made my way to the stairs and went up to my room. When I got inside, I noticed that the officers, after examining the scene, had taken the time to close drawers and tidy up. But as I began gathering clothes and toiletries, something caught my eye. Balanced against my bedroom mirror, the same mirror in which I'd seen the keeper, standing behind me, was a six by six inch box, a shadow box. Inside was a beautiful violet, pink and white butterfly. It was missing its right wing, just like me.